Okay, well, I would like to welcome you all um, and thank you so much for being here. Obviously, by you being here, it means that you care about this community, and um, that is so extremely important. And we have an awful lot of good information here tonight, so I'm glad you came. I'd like to uh, put out a very special thanks to Christy and Tiffany with Remax Alliance for their community support of tonight's town hall meeting. Um, you can see their information at the bottom of their flyer. Um, I'd also like to thank Sharon Trill of My Mountain Town, who is uh, videotaping everything tonight, and also Conifer Jabber, Jazzercise for providing water. So if you get thirsty, there's water down there. Also, a link will be available in the next day or two, we're hoping tomorrow, for you to view the meeting again and for other people to view it for the first time. So we'll be getting that out to our email list. If you are not on that email list, um, we have people at the front uh, table that are taking names and email addresses if you'd like to sign up for that. So our speakers tonight have been asked to present just the facts, not in support of or opposition to any development, ballot issue, candidate, or anything else. Um, most of you have been here many times. I see a lot of familiar faces, but wow, it's wonderful to actually see your faces after we've had mask mandates for so long. So I'm glad to be able to see that. One thing that we do do is we have presentations from 7 to 8. There are no questions, no comments during that time. And then from 8 to 9, we have an open house, and you are able to go up and talk to all of the speakers and presenters and ask your questions and everything at that time. So, what is going on around here? Um, first of all, we have a um, Conifer Chamber update, and Sharon Trill is going to be giving that update in the absence of a director for you in the room. Sharon. Thank you, Shirley. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're having a great night. I am wanting to just let you know that we are currently working on our 2022 Chamber Directory and we're hoping to get that finished and mailed out. So look for that in your mailboxes sometime around June if we're in track. Um, but the big thing I really want to tell you about is our upcoming Elevation Celebration Summer Street Fair. That's going to be happening June, or sorry, July 30th and 31st along Sutton Road as usual. There she is. And we're going to be kicking it off with the Conquer Area Council Trails team and Conifer Locals Unified Boosters Elevation Celebration Run Walk. So if you'd like to get signed up for that to help support them, that'd be great. And then afterwards, we're going to have live music and vendors and great food and drink and parties and just kids activities and lots of fun over on Sutton Road. That's behind where Aston Park Wine and Spirits is. It will be all day Saturday and all day Sunday. So we hope you'll come out and enjoy that, bring your friends and just have a good time because that's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Yes, hopefully everybody gets out. It's a, it's a great time and you meet so many people that you never met before, so it'll be great. Um, next, um, we have an RTD update. Um, Peggy Catlin, who is our director, was unable to make it tonight, but she did send a, um, an update, and Marilyn Salzman, our secretary of Conifer Council, is going to give that update. Marilyn. So Shirley gave me this about five minutes ago. I'll try to read it with feeling. <laughs> the board adopted a resolution in support of SB 22-180, which would provide for fair, free period during high ozone months in the summer. It is hoped that the three fairs could encourage increased ridership and help to reduce vehicle miles traveled and thus vehicle admission, emissions. The Transportation Security Administration has lifted the mask mandate, effective April 19, in case you haven't heard. RTD has also lifted its mandate on its buses and rail, as well as within its facilities. RTD has been working with law enforcement and the city and county of Denver to curb unwelcome activities at Denver Union Station and other facilities. General Manager Deborah Johnson has stated that we will proceed with, quote, firm compassion. RTD and the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 1001 agreed to terms for a collective bargaining agreement for the next several years. It is hoped that the increased pay and benefit package will attract operators and other critical positions in order to restore service. 
And lastly, RTD is required to revise its district boundaries every 10 years based on census data. District N has expanded a bit geographically. Each of the 15 RTD directors represent approximately 200,000 constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. And we normally have CDOT here um, to give an update, but they really don't have anything new um, to report since the February town hall meeting. But you can go to conifereacouncil.org to find an excellent PowerPoint that they did present at the February town hall meeting. Um, Brian and Jana with CDOT presented that. And U.S. 285 corridor improvements, um, it, it, well, it's regarding the U.S. 285 corridor improvements near Pine Junction. The, uh, the project includes widening US 285 to four lanes and building a depressed median as well as acceleration and deceleration lanes at interchanges between Richmond Hill and Schaefer's Crossing and an interchange at Kings Valley. So um, if you get a chance, go you know, look at that presentation if you didn't see it before, it's excellent. Okay, next we have Jessica Paulson. She is the Public Services Manager for the Mountain Libraries. Um, and she's going to be talking about the Conifer Library. Jessica. Thanks, Shirley. It's good to see you all again. Um, I just wanted to give you an update on a couple of programs that are coming up at Conifer Library. Um, as always, we have our regular family story times on Saturdays at 10.15. Next Wednesday is our always popular Art House program. Um, and then our biggest upcoming program is next week. It's one of our signature programs at JCPL. It's called World Reborn. It's an author event with best-selling author Jeff Vandermeer. He's the author of Annihilation, which was turned into a movie a few years ago. Um, it's going to be hosted by Ian Tafoya, and it is a virtual event. Um, so please register online in advance. It'll be really interactive with polls and trivia and prizes. So um, that's coming up next Friday on the 29th at 6.30 p.m. So hope to see you there. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. So next, um, as you know, we um, have a lot of different developments going on in the Conifer area. And Heather Gutherless is always willing to come and talk about what all is going on. And to let you know that you always have a say in what is going on out here. And she um, gives that information to you, but also you have it with your, your packet tonight. So Heather. Thanks, Shirley. Again, my name is Heather Gutherless, and I am with Planning and Zoning, and I wanted to give you an update tonight on what's going, been going on in Planning and Zoning since the last Conifer Area Council meeting. And we'll see. Just a little, adding a little suspense to get you all interested. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is one of our regulation amendments. This is not in the packet that you have tonight because it's a different type of case, but I wanted to talk about it because it is coming up pretty quickly here for some hearings, but also to let you know that Jefferson County Planning and Zoning is always looking for ways to improve efficiencies with our regulations and with our processes in the department. We just recently were reviewing some numbers in planning and zoning. Since 2006, 2021 was one of our busiest years for building permits and development cases. Now, 2006 was pre-recession. At that point in time, the county had 22 planners, and now we only have 15. So we're doing about the same amount of work with fewer planners. So we're always looking for ways that we can improve our processes. This regulation is one of the things that we're proposing to alleviate some of the uh, processing time that both staff and the applicants deal with. So one of the things that we're looking at is removing the requirement for a permit for fences. Any new construction or replacement of fences, right now you have to come into Jefferson County and get a permit for that. This would remove that permitting requirement. It wouldn't remove any of the requirements regarding height 
or setbacks, vision clearance triangles, so the materials, all of those would still need to be met, and if they weren't met, somebody could call in a complaint and we would go and check that out. But the upfront permit would no longer be required. Similar to that, the sheds, well, what we call mini structures, which include things like sheds and greenhouses, would also be included in a removal of a permitting requirement. Right now those require a miscellaneous permit. Those, um, those types of permits, again, would still be required, or those types of projects would still be required to meet all the standards. They would not be able to be more than 14 feet in height. There would be setbacks required, a side setback and a rear setback of five feet, so they could not be right up against property lines. But one of the things that we found in our research was that the when planning and zoning has received complaints about fences and sheds, the vast majority of the complaints, um, the, the applicant actually only needed the, the permit. They complied with all of the regulations, but they just didn't obtain the permit. So it's very um, likely that all of the regulations will still be met. I also wanted to let everyone know that one of the things that we've heard is, well, what about inspections? And planning and zoning never has done inspections of fences. We review the initial application, and we make sure it meets the standards, but we've never gone out and done inspections, so that wouldn't be removed. Additionally, with sheds there that are less than 200 square feet, um, the building codes are not required to be met for those types of structures, so they're not reviewed by building safety. And also there are some exceptions to the mini structures where if it is over 200 square feet, if it is a habitable space, if it's used commercially or for livestock, it would still require a permit through the county. And then lastly, with this regulation amendment, we're looking at decreasing the side setbacks just in the R1 zone district, and that would make it five feet, which is very similar to the rest of our residential zone districts. The setback for any structures housing livestock would remain at the 15 feet as it currently is. So those hearings are coming up to April 27th, next Wednesday, and then May 10th for the Board of County Commissioners. Now on to the development proposals. The development proposals are actually down since February. In February there were 28 development proposals in the conifer area, and now there are 25. There are no new pre-applications to talk about, no new rezoning, or, sorry, no new community meetings, and no new subdivision plats. I was gonna go over three rezonings, a site development plan, and then one other case that I have heard is of a lot of interest in the community. And the first one is the one that is of a lot of interest. It's not on your list because it is has only gone through a pre-application process so far and it has been over a year since that pre-application, so it's fallen off the list. But it is the full send bike ranch that was proposed off of Shadow Mountain Drive. This was for a mountain bike park, and the oh, there is not a formal application on this. From talking to the case manager, he does still correspond with the applicants, so there is still a chance it will come in. But if something does come in, there will be our typical notification requirements. And Conifer Area Council is one of our um, organizations that we always notify. So if you are a part of that mailing list, you would find out about any applications. Next, I want to talk about three rezoning cases. A rezoning case is a case that's required if somebody wants to change the land uses on their property. So if they want to go from a residential use to more of a commercial use, they would have to go through the process of a rezoning. That process is shown on the screen, and I just wanted to highlight a few areas where there is opportunity for community input. Those are the community meeting, which is before a formal application is made. Then at the time of formal application, there's a referral that's sent out and homeowners associations are notified. And then at the hearings, there's opportunity for public testimony. The first rezoning case that I wanted to talk about is number eight in your packet. It is Conifer Commons, Conifer Center, I think they've kind of changed their name, but it is the proposal that is just east of the Safeway for 188 residential units. 
This is kind of similar to the full site by Grinch in that the, talking to the case manager, they still do correspond with the applicant, but there are some outstanding issues that need to be resolved, and the applicant is still working on those, so there hasn't been a whole lot of progress since the last meeting. The next rezoning is rezoning number 11, and this property is near South Turkey Creek Road and South Deer Creek Canyon Road. It's off of South Turkey Creek Road. And this is actually a, a fairly, what we would consider a fairly simple rezoning. The property is four and a half acres, and they actually have two different zone districts on their property. So they want to correct that. They have, they're currently zoned MR1 and Agricultural 2, I think it is. And so they want to make it all one zone district. They're making it a planned development so that the, there is no increase in the number of lots. There's no increase in the number of houses. The minimum lot size would be four acres and so that there could be no subdivision in the future. That planning commission hearing is going on tonight for that case. And then the Board of County Commissioners is May 3rd. The last rezoning case is rezoning number 11. And it's actually somewhat similar to the last rezoning case where they have two, two different zone districts um, this is a part of the property, and then there's some agricultural property here, and they want to rezone to be able to put an addition on their house. It is a rather small property, 1.16 acres, and I forgot to tell you where it was. It's near the Tiny Town area. So you can see on the screen here, this is Tiny Town, and this property is here off of Chamberlain Road. They just recently came in and did a sufficiency review. There wasn't everything that we needed as a planning staff to send it out in referral. So once that is complete, then we would send notice to the Confer Area Council and um, they can send out notice to everyone else. The last type of case that I wanted to talk about is a site development plan. The site development plan is a little bit different in that the uses on a property are already established. So one of the things that staff does not evaluate at all is whether or not the use is appropriate for the area. The use is already there, the zoning is already established. So staff looks at other technical site design issues such as landscaping, architecture, drainage, access points, things like that. The site development plan that I wanted to give you an update on that has changed since the last Conifer Area Council meeting is in the Aspen Park area. And it is the old uh, Bank of the West building. The, it, the proposal is to convert that to an auto parts retail store. And so they are in the process. They're moving along. At the last meeting, they were in the second referral, and now they're in the third referral process. That concludes all the cases. I will be standing over here tonight to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. So, are you prepared for the next wildfire? We don't know when it's going to be, but wildfire season is all year now, so it could happen at any minute. And we have our wildfire specialists from Elk Creek Fire and from Inner Canyon Fire Departments to talk about what and who can help. Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to do a quick introduction now. I'm going to hand it over to Captain Yellen for the first part of what we're going to talk about. I'm John Mandel. I'm the wildland captain for Inter Canyon Fire Protection District. Um, my door is always open if you guys have questions or anything after this. If you don't catch us here today, please feel free to, uh, to reach out. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ben. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Benjamin Yellen. I'm the wildlife captain at Elk Creek Fire. I've uh, been here just going on four years now. Uh, we've done a number of these presentations, um, and we've always focused on one program in particular. Lately, it's been the CWPP. Tonight, we're going to try and review how we've got here, where we're trying to go with the division, and try and give you some direction into our decision-making process. So. Um, we've been coordinating as a division with Elk Creek and Inner Canyon for about a year and a half now. Um, it's been going extremely well because our first main <coughs> project that we did together was the CWPP. We did that to save money and we did that to get on the same page moving forward with all of our programs. So um, 
we really wanted to incorporate the cohesive strategy. Who here has heard of the national cohesive strategy? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay. So what we're trying to do is incorporate landscape scale restoration, fire adapted communities, and safe and effective fire response. So that is a national level uh, directive for wildfire mitigation and preparation. So that's how we've incorporated everything into our CWPP and all of our programs moving forward. So what the CWPP has given us um, is positive feedback from the community that we're on the right track. Um, and we've also actually signed the CWPP with all the stakeholders, so it's completely done. Um, <clears throat> the updated link will be on the website as soon as we get the finished document from the contractors that we have. Um, not a whole lot changed from the public meeting, just minor tweaks in language based on some of the planning units that we had. So if you were here during that meeting, um, what we've done within the whole 154 square miles of Elk Creek Inner Canyon, we've broken them up into planning units. And so that's been <clears throat> the backbone of the CWPP to figure out how to take bites out of the giant elephant that is the significant wildfire risk that we have um, in the Conifer area. So while we have the 46 planning units, we'll go through all of the programs and how that relates um, to all of the programs throughout the summer and some of the, the programs specifically identified within those planning units. Um, within the projects, if you don't mind going to the next one, um, we do have a lot of projects out there on the ground right now. Um, and we also work with the Upper South Platte Partnership. Has anybody heard of the Upper South Platte Partnership? All right, some more hands. So uh, we work with our partners, Jefferson County, Colorado State Forest Service, Denver Water, to really promote landscape scale restoration work. Um, they are our main partners in doing a large acre treatments. But recently that's kind of changed. So John and I were integral with the USPP proposal for the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative, which made this area a focal area in the state. And what's that, what that's done is brought more attention and hopefully more money to the area so we can continue to do what we're doing. Um, we've done a number of acres, and unfortunately we have other maps prepared for you, but uh, due to technical difficulties, um, we'll try and get them out to you, but we are going to be updating this website. These are other ongoing projects for USPP partners and for all of our projects, if you can go down a little bit, within the fire department with our crews. And so if you haven't been to this website, you can actually click on those boxes and get detailed information on, on some of those projects. And if you go up just a little bit more, John. So where the project, sorry, by the way. So right there in that heat map there, um, that's where a lot of our, our landscape scale partners have been able to wrangle projects. And how we run grants is trying to coordinate at a landscape scale to reduce risk most effectively. And so what we're happy to say is we also got a further grant from the Colorado State Forest Service for defensible space. And so we focused on the Hill Hill Pines planning unit to do defensible space work based on those projects around here. So we're gonna do landscape scale restoration work around it. We're gonna do the defensible space and education of the homeowners at the same time. So we're trying to be more effective with the money that we have in some of the most high risk areas that we do have. Um, also, what we do have on the bottom there is um, a lot of the projects that our crews do. So if you're not aware, we run a 10 person uh, suppression module. Jason Cavendish is the lead over there if you wanna ask me any questions after we're done presenting. Um, but we do a lot of significant work with grants. We do a lot of fire breaks, landscape scale restora restoration work in some of the hard, hard places to get to. I think the average slope that you guys were working on the last project was right around 40%, <clears throat> excuse me, something like that. So really hard, hard terrain um, and specialized work that we do there. Um, they started in 2012 and they currently have two projects going on. The fuels crew 
also started in 2021. Um, and they're expanding their workload. They do run the chipping program, but they do a number of other projects as well. Um, and we'll have more information on the website as that gets out. Um, both resources also provide some highly trained um, response capabilities that we desperately need in this area. Um, right now, we'll have 15 people in the district specializing in hand crew work. And if anybody's ever fought a wildland fire, hand crews are hard to come by and it's hard work. So these guys are well trained and know what they're doing when they come to the fire. We actually had a really good instance with the Snowy Peak Fire. Um, they were able to come and really support our other responding or other responding resources. And we've actually done a lot of combined wildland trainings in order to incorporate everything. So the Snowy Peak Fire, um, we had a great success with that, and that was on the border of Ullman Park and Hilldale Pines. Um, and we actually were there in about 10 minutes and had to line around that pretty quickly. So we were actually pretty excited about how everything turned out there. Um, with the combination of the resources, we would like to keep all the fires to the minimum. And again, another map that we we're going to have is all the fires that we actually responded to um, as a division. But due to technical difficulties, we couldn't do that. We'll try and get more information out, and John's going to take over. Thank you, Captain Young. Um, I want to start off real quick with all of this information is available to you if you go to either one of our websites, intercanyonfire.org or elkcreekfire.org. Uh, click the wildland tab and it will bring you to the same exact website, this one right here, and it has all of the information on um, current events and stuff like that for the wildland division. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple other programs that we offer. Um, one is the Community Ambassador Program. If you live in our district, you are part of a planning unit, and what we're striving for is a, an ambassador in every planning unit, at least one. Um, if you don't know who your ambassador is, you can go to the website, you can search your address, you can click on the, the little fire insignias on there, and you can see if there's a planning or if there's a, uh, an ambassador for your planning unit. If there's not, consider being an ambassador. And what an ambassador does is they are that, that link of communication from the community to the fire district and back. So instead of us having to try to, to contact everybody in the community, we can reach out to an ambassador who can then spread the word through their neighbors and through their, their local social networks and stuff like that, which really makes it more effective for us to get messages out to, to the general public. Um, so if you don't have uh, uh, an idea if you have an ambassador, please do check out the ambassador page on the website. Um, we also, in 2017, we started the uh, chipping program. Uh, how many people signed up for chipping this year? Yes, thanks. Um, it is full. We've got an amazing, amazing demand for the program, and we are full to capacity with the, the number of people that we have. Um, we cannot take any more uh, chipping signups at this time. But um, to give you an idea of, of what the chipping program is capable of, our crew last year chipped as much as some county-wide chipping programs offered throughout the state just in our fire district. So that's a testament to how hard our crew works, how much the demand is for our program because of you guys uh, all want to take advantage of it. So we greatly uh, uh, appreciate your support and um, it, we would love to, to have more crews out there and more capacity to do that. Right now, we are just kind of strapped with where we're at with the fire district on, on shipping. Um, the other program that we offer is home assessments, wildfire prepared. Anybody here have a wildfire, wildfire prepared assessment done? Awesome. Um, so that is a home assessment and what we do is we look at the, the, uh, the structure itself, so your home or surrounding buildings, as well as your defensible space. And what we do is uh, it's about a two to three hour assessment where we walk around with you, the homeowner, and uh, it's an education process to where we enlighten you on what will make your house, your property more resilient to wildland fire. Um, the signups for that are available on our website, and it is uh, just a fantastic program. And, and a lot of people become overwhelmed. You can sit there and, and talk and talk for two to three hours. The nice thing is you will get a, a very thorough report at the end of that. Um, it'll include pictures and, and very specific instructions. 
and that is your work plan for implementing that all the, all the work described in the uh, in the assessment. So, if you have any questions about that, please do feel free to reach out. And again, there's a lot of information on the website. Um, I want to finish up with, I have to say that uh, all of this is not possible without uh, the support of our crews, um, the, the folks who are part of the Wildland Division work very hard and they're very proud of what they do. Um, they make Ben and I look, look amazing, uh, which we really appreciate, so I can't say enough thanks, and there's a few of the crew here tonight. Um, can't say enough good things about them. And it's also because of the support we get from our chiefs. Uh, we are constantly brainstorming and we come up with some hairball ideas, but there are times where we'll sit down with the chiefs and it's like, what do you think of this? And, and it, it's, you know, we'll work through the kinks and stuff with the chiefs and was like, we're behind you 100%, make it happen. So if it wasn't for our chiefs, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have the success of the programs that we have. And then we wouldn't be able to implement that for you guys in the community. So um, nothing makes us more proud than bringing these programs to you guys and serving you guys. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out afterwards. I appreciate you coming out tonight. So John talked about the chipping program. There's also the slash collection sites. And in your packet, there is um, a whole page on all the information you need to know to take your slash to the collection sites. So keep that on your refrigerator or whatever. It's really important to be doing that. Um, and um, both John and Ben talked a lot about the community ambassadors, and I believe we have a few of them here tonight. So would you stand up if you are a community ambassador? Well, first of all, thank you. And second of all, um, there is a map that we can bring up at the end. And if you, even here, before looking on the website later tonight or whatever, um, you can see what unit you're in, and we can get contact information from you if you would like to be contacted by your con um, community ambassador. And if your community ambassador is here, you can meet tonight. So we're hoping that that will happen. So thank you very much, community ambassadors. Um, next, we um, obviously had um, some candidates out here that I think many of you talked to, and I'd like to introduce them tonight. Um, first of all, the Elk Creek candidates, um, and if you would stand up as I call your name. First of all, Dominique Devaney, and I'm going to massacre these names. Okay, Dominique. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. And then we've got Melissa Baker. Melissa's back in the back. <laughs> and they'll have, they'll have a chance to talk to him again after the meeting. Um, Greg Pixley. Greg's right here. Okay. Um, Charles Newby. And then John Mullen. Is John here tonight? Okay. Joe Wynand. Okay. Great. And then we have um, four candidates from Inner Canyon. I don't know who else here tonight, but Ginny Riley, I believe, is. Ginny's in the back, back here. We've got Jackie White, and I believe Jackie had a bunch of other things with kids and stuff tonight. We've got Natalie Arnett. Natalie, right? And Ann Imsey. Ann. Okay, well thank you all for being here, and please stick around to talk to the candidates, get a feel for um, who they are, what they're about, um, if they're a fit for, for what you're thinking about for the fire department and what they should be doing. Um, next, we actually had the Colorado State Legislature, um, uh, Tammy Story and Lisa Cutter, and they both um, ran into some problems tonight, so neither one could be here, so we do not have a legislative update. But we have the new Director of Business Development, Rob Osborne, with Core Electric Cooperative, and that used to be IREA, but he's going to talk about Core and the evolving utility industry. Rob. Thank you very much, Shirley. Uh, good evening, and thank you so much for allowing us to participate. Um, so I've been on the job seven weeks, so uh, I'm sorry if there's something you need me to address. I'll do my best to try to help you 
as I'm set up at the table later this evening. Um, but I was given just a few minutes to speak, so I just wanted to introduce myself and talk about CORE. Um, many of you may have under recently saw that on your bills and some messaging that you know, we've changed our name, what that's related to, um, and a little bit about some of the efforts that we're working with to help communities um, reignite the business and um, economic things that are, we need to do to keep our communities running. So, um, just so folks know, uh, this is our service territory, and it's pretty large, it's about 5,000 square miles. Um, we're actually the largest rural electric utility in Colorado. Um, you guys are situated in District 2. We have one of our district offices here, right off of 285, about two to three miles east of here. And um, our communities that we serve are very diverse. As a rural electric cooperative, um, a few differences than other utilities. We're not regulated by the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, significantly like other utilities such as Excel and Black Hills Energy. Um, we have board of directors that actually regulates um, all the activities we do. So as customers, you're members and you're actually our owners of, the, of, of our utility. So we thank you for being an owner and being a member. Um, your district uh, board member is Mr. Ron Kilgore, if you know him in the community. Um, he's been on the board for many years and he represents yeah, this district. We also have franchise communities, so communities that are incorporated throughout different counties. Um, so these are cities and towns, and I just listed them so you have the stats there. Um, so what's happening with electric? Uh, you may have, we just spoke to the fire district. Um, there's environmental changes, uh, there's policy changes, a lot of different things that are affecting how we run our business. Um, and most importantly, um, it's putting a great deal of strain on the utilities to try to figure out how to do the two things that we're supposed to do. Keep reliability high and keep the bills low. Um, that's one of the key things that most utilities have focused on for over a century. And policy and environmental issues are becoming more and more impacting on those two areas. So what I wanted to show you here is, it's a bad picture, so I, I apologize, but the old way is we, we make energy, Put it on a transmission line, distribution, you know, the telephone poles as we call them. Uh, normally, nerds like me call them distribution poles. And then it gets to your house or to your business. You know, straightforward. Now, people want change. People want choice. People want options. Um, and we have to drive to have more renewable resources. So the generation is changing. It's not a power plant anymore. It's distributed. It could be solar. It could be wind. Um, it could be a multitude of different uses that pe people want at their homes. They want EVs, they want to manage their energy real time. Um, we call them super users in the industry, folks that are you know, literally looking at their cell phone at the app and saying, okay, can I shut off an appliance? Um, I'm getting close to a certain level of energy and I don't want to hit that because I may hit the time of use rate. And those are other things that are happening. Um, so we have to be dynamic. What's interesting about CORE is all of our meters as an electric utility are um, automated. There are utilities like Excel Energy, real big ones, Colorado Springs utilities that are still implementing automated meters. Um, and this is enabling us to look at how we use energy in peak events, and how we can help you conserve, and how we can help price energy at different times during the day. So over the next few years, you're going to see more options in how you can use your energy, how you want to take your energy, and how you want your energy priced. Um, lastly, I think the one thing that we have to talk about at high level is where the nation is going. Um, with more and more electrified uh, activities. So as we electrify our cars and electrify our homes, um, that puts more strain on the grid. So capacity planning is something that we need to do collectively, not just with our constituents, our members, but we have to do with other utilities across the state. And there's a great deal of efforts that are happening in the state house to talk about that, but also with RTOs within other enterprises that can help us balance energy and pull energy from different parts of the country. Colorado doesn't have that right now, and that's one of the emerging things that's changing and giving us that flexibility. So what's my job? Um, my job is to create new business opportunities for the core. And you ask, well, how does that benefit me? I'm a member, you know, if you get new business, you just told me I need more energy. Isn't that a strain on, on my, my cost? Well, it's a real simple fact. We have two different parts here built to make it simple. Um, to understand the fixed costs. That's the poles, the wires, all the things that you see that we do every day. Um, those are the fixed costs, the assets. 
And then there's the variable cost. The variable cost is the commodities that we use to make energy, the cost of wind, solar, and all that. The more people that we can get to use kilowatt hours, that means they're paying a larger percentage of their fixed cost. So if you think about a small business or your home, you're paying a very small part of, your, of the fixed cost of, the, of our business. But if we get a large user, like a data center or a major manufacturing facilities, they pay a larger portion of those fixed costs, which keeps rates stable. So it goes back to the old you know, 120, 130 years ago, the train companies and the utilities started economic development. The more people that can pay for their systems, the more stable and the more flat their rates stay. So my job is to try to help bring in more industrial and commercial companies um, throughout our service territory. Probably not a major impact here in the more rural areas, the mountainous areas, but as you know, we serve I-70 corridor on the east side of Denver and Douglas County and Elbert County on um, the southeast of Denver. So we have a lot of opportunity to try to drive more, more large business to our communities. We have three areas in which my team um, works in. As I mentioned, um, business development, which is economic development. So we work with our partners, the counties, the economic development, and chamber organizations throughout our territory to help drive development and new business. Um, key accounts, this is something we have not had at core. So we look at large users. We also look at industry types, so school districts, government, um, and trying to work with them to learn about how they use their energy and how we can help them conserve energy and keep their bills low. Um, community relations. We do a lot of nonprofit giving. Mr. Kilgore is very committed to this community. I know we have a lot of events, a lot of nonprofits we support over here. Uh, we're doing a shred event coming up, I think, in June. I was told before I left the office. So that's in partnership. Uh, we're going to be shredding up folks to create documents and such. Um, and then we have stakeholder relations. And this is the local government enterprise um, activity. You know, when, when local governments and regional um, councils like this have concerns about policy, or about how we're doing our work, my team will be the voice and the ears to listen and voice your opinions uh, to our board. So some new things that we're also looking at in the innovative side, uh, electrification, um, looking at projects with electric vehicles. Um, this is something that we have not been deeply involved in. Uh, we really left it to the members to make their choice what you want to do. But we know we have to help that transition and educate members on the benefits of electrification of vehicles as well as help some of our larger community uh, partners like the school districts. Um, so we have two pilots that we're, we're jumping into. Um, one is to partner with the communities where we can actually find locations for EV chargers. I stopped for Mexican food tonight just down the street, and there's a big Tesla drive up over there in the shopping center. Um, other communities are interested in having these type of uh, charging facilities. And as a utility provider, uh, we think it's probably beneficial for our members to come to us to charge the vehicles or we teach our members about electrification of vehicles. Um, battery and microgrid, so as we get more renewable, we get to store it, right? So working with customers and communities on where we can put these assets uh, and how we can then manage them together. And then lastly, um, our balancing efforts with our advanced management programming. This would be the ability to take some of the energy that we're charging and storing in batteries and then maybe deploy it at peak events, again, to keep our, our uh, peak events not so high, not so low. So that's the end of my formal presentation. I did have a question to ask about um, our cameras with wildfire mitigation. So CORE, like every utility in Colorado, has uh, spent a lot of time working with the fire districts in the state to come up with a wildfire mitigation plan. It's on our website. It's posted. You can see it's like 30 pages, and there's a lot of attachments. Um, but one of the things that we've also deployed is a pilot are three cameras um, so that we can kind of see it in advance. Um, so one of the cameras is, excuse me, at Badger Mountain up in Park County. The other is at Squaw Mountain in Clear Creek. And the third camera should be deployed soon because I understand we ordered it. Just don't know when to get it delivered. But it's going to be at the Elk Creek Fire um, Command Center. So um, under the Common Communications Tower. So that's right here in your community. And and enable us to be a little bit more, um, have a little more time. So, thank you. Thank you, Rob. I am so excited about those cameras because if they can detect fires a lot sooner, that 
that is so much better. So um, we'll, we'll get more information on that as it comes out. Um, so next we have um, Commissioner Dalhamber, and she's going to give an update about the county. And I'm not sure what she's talking about tonight because there's so much going on. So um, good luck. <laughs> Thanks so much, Shirley. Hi, everyone. How are you tonight? It's good to see you. What a great turnout. I'm Leslie Dalkemper, one of your three county commissioners, and I have the privilege of representing District 3, which includes all of Conifer. I serve on the Board of County Commissioners with Commissioners Kraft Tharp and Commissioner Kerr as well. I was texting a little bit with Representative Cutter uh, a bit earlier, who chairs the Wildfire Matters Committee, and that committee has been working very hard on identifying grants uh, and matching grants for homeowners as well as counties and others to help with issues of wildfire mitigation. Uh, so she wanted me to make sure I shared that and she was sorry she couldn't be here tonight. She's a little under the weather. We have quite a few things to talk about tonight and I'll try to keep it within my six minutes. Um, but first, I wanted to share a little bit about the Board of County Commissioners. You know, it's not the only board that county commissioners serve on. Many of us serve on upwards of 12 different boards, commissions, special work groups, and more. And they deal with everything from early childhood education to wildfire uh, risk reduction to air quality, as well as water quality and more. And there are three I wanted to point out in particular. Well, we'll make that four, <laughs> according to the slide. I serve uh, as one of two county commissioners on the Colorado Fire Commission. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work of that commission tonight because it has a direct impact on Jefferson County as well as many other areas of the state that are in the wildland urban interface. We'll talk about some of the work uh, and recommendations that we just sent last week to the governor's office and that we expect to be turned into a bill in the remaining days of the legislative session. I also chair the Wildfire Commission and I co-chair Jeff Copright Futures, and that is a group that focuses on early childhood education. How do we ensure that families and children who want access to quality education, early childhood education, have access to that care? We've been doing a lot of work in that area. And then, of course, the Opioid Regional Council. How many of you are familiar with the opioid settlement litigation dollars? that Colorado is about to receive. I see a few hands going up. The state is expected to receive $400 million, and we want to make sure that the bulk of those dollars go right back into our communities for prevention, recovery, treatment, and education. A little bit about the Colorado Fire Commission. We've been working hard. We have multiple committees, subcommittees, that do deeper dives on different types of topics. And I've been serving, serving on the Wildland Urban Interface Subcommittee. That committee was charged by the governor with the task of looking at how we think about growth and development in the wildland urban interface. And the governor asked us to look at everything from statutory requirements to best practices to incentive based plans. I know this is an issue in talking with constituents from Conifer, Evergreen, Pine, and the surrounding area that is very much on our minds. How are we thoughtful? How are we smart? about growth and development in the WUI, and what does that look like, and what's the impact for planning and zoning, for policies at the county level, and much more. So we have sent to the governor a framework that for the first time ever would look at minimum building codes in the wildland urban interface, and it would include things like defensible space, enhanced mitigation, as well as home hardening fire ignition resistant materials and more. Now some of this work we've already done at the county level, but this would be at the statewide level. And so the WUI board, which we're proposing, would actually go into depth studying best practices, looking at our needs in Colorado, identifying some of the gaps. We're gonna share with them some of the findings uh, from our work over the last several months. But this is a, a really big deal for Colorado which, uh, unlike other states, does not have a minimum building code in the Wooly. So I wanted to make sure to bring this to your attention so you're aware of some of the work we're doing on the state level and how it impacts us here locally. Just a quick note on the Bright Futures work, we created a roadmap uh, for Jefferson County to look at increasing access to early child education. And 
One of the things we did recently, and I want to thank the Conifer Chamber for its help, the Evergreen Chamber was helpful, Jefferson County EDC, in terms of connecting us with business leaders, small business owners, and parents to give us feedback about some of the lessons learned during the pandemic. We know, again, listening to members of our community, how challenging that time was in terms of finding quality child care. So we will take those findings and update our roadmap to reflect what we learned during the pandemic. And then finally, uh, we have the Opioid Regional Council. Our region, uh, which we're, we're likely to call the Gateway to the Rockies Opioid Prevention Regional Council, is made up of three counties. It's Jefferson County, it's Clear Creek, and Gilpin. And on the county are uh, multiple members reflecting different stakeholder groups. From county government, we, have, we each have a county commissioner. I serve on that council. We have people from human services, law enforcement, uh, behavioral health, and more. And in June, June 23rd, we're going to hold a statewide, I'm sorry, not a statewide, a regional conference to look at the opioid epidemic in those three counties. We'll also take a look at what's working to fight the opioid epidemic and see where the gaps are and where, how can we best leverage what we think will be about $32 million coming to our region over 18 years. So we have a lot of work to do on that front and we'll get lots of input from people who are experts in this area to help guide our decision making. We're also going to hear from people who are in recovery as well. And uh, the AG Attorney General will also be part of the conference. So if you'd like more information about that, please let me know. The other big area I wanted to just touch on tonight, and this is a graphic that our Jeffco Open Space team came up with. We're focusing on three key areas. And I also want to acknowledge Captain Yellen, who's been a part of this conversation, Chief Ware, all of our Chiefs, Chief Ouija, Chief Sherlock, and others who have been incredible partners throughout this process as we really get our arms around how do we address in a comprehensive and thorough way reducing wildfire risk and what specifically is the county's role in that effort. So you'll see that we, oops, I think I turned it off. We have three key areas we're looking at. Protecting people and structures, reducing fuels, and recycling biomass. And a number of these recommendations also came out of the work of the Jeffco Wildfire Risk Reduction Task Force, which is now the Wildfire Commission. Our next step is to find funding to make this happen. So just quickly, protecting people and structures really deals with issues around inventory and assessing, again, where our gaps lie, also looking at planning and zoning regulations, what do we need to bring up to date? Should we, for example, and I know our fire chiefs have strong opinions about this, adopt the entire international WUI code, which by the way is also something that WUI board that I mentioned earlier will be looking at at the state level. The reducing fuels piece has a lot to do with mitigation, thinning forest, defensible space, and recycling biomass is what do we do with those branches, those limbs, um, and slash. And so one of the other areas we're looking at is maintaining not only the summer rotating sites, but also looking at, and or depending on the budget, year-round sites um, that people can come to whenever it's most convenient for you to drop off your slash. At the very bottom, you'll see some of the funding sources that we're looking at. One of the areas that we're, we've been working closely with Captain Yellen and others on is the Colorado Strategic Wildfire uh, Action Program, or COSWA. Jeffco is one of only six or seven counties across the state that has been identified to participate in this program. We're also looking at how we can use American Rescue Plan dollars to really beef up uh, planning and zoning codes too in the wildland urban interface. So those are just some of the examples of the three big areas we're working on. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer those. And then last but not least, I want to encourage you, and Heather is going to uh, do a big favor for me and just share handouts that I'll just ask you to pass to your neighbor. We are holding a budget forum on May 4th from 5.30 to 7 at Our Lady of Pines in Conifer. We need your input. We're facing budget cuts upwards of $20 million. And if wildfire mitigation matters to you, please come. Take an hour and a half if you can out of your evening on May 4th and let us know if that is an issue 
that you think is important for the county to fund. I can certainly say it, the other commissioners can, we can advocate for it, but it's also important that we hear from you if this is a priority. I will tell you, we're asking about wildfire mitigation in some of the community surveys we've been doing. It has been coming up, it came up as a top uh, issue in our telephone town hall, which we held on Monday. We did some polling during that telephone, telephone town hall. That public safety came in first, and then I think rose and wildfire mitigation. I may have that order wrong, but it was among one of the top three issues. The other thing is, I'm concerned because we only have 10 RSVPs for the Conifer community meeting. Commissioner Kerr has at least 20 or more for Lakewood. I know we can outdo Lakewood and Commissioner Kerr, so I hope you all can make it for this conversation. It's a, it's a big one. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at my email address or my direct line, and you can reach all three commissioners at commish at jeffco.us. I'll be here if you have any questions, and thanks so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, Leslie. I have a few comments and um, it is things that I'd like you to know about um, before we meet the candidates more and, and some different things. Um, first of all, if you are interested in water resources, which is another huge concern of people up here, um, John Wallach is getting people um, to help with a study that we're doing. He will be back at the table back here and you can meet with him and get signed up for that. Um, our candidates are going to be in the lobby again, so please go meet the candidates um, for both Inner Canyon and Elk Creek Fire Departments. Um, uh, then talk to your wildfire specialists over here um, with questions, but also to determine which planning unit you are in. And if our um, ambassadors, community ambassadors, want to come up here too, then we can kind of match you together. So you'll get to know. I think there's going to be some barbecues going on and everything this summer so we can get neighbors meeting neighbors and work on mitigation projects. So um, it's a very, very, very important thing to do. Um, our other speakers, of course, will still be sitting around here to talk to you also. So um, thank you again to Tiffany and Christy with Remax Alliance and to Sharon Troke with My Mountain Town and Connor for Jazzercise. Hopefully we will have that link out tomorrow. We'll get it out to you and to other community members so everybody can see this um, meeting and see the important information that was shared. Um, and we will be starting up our town hall meetings again um, in September. But in the meantime, come to Elevation Celebration this summer and get out there and mitigate your properties. Thank you for coming. There's a lot of other people up in the back that